We are here to check out the answers and explanations to the questions from the January 2020 Chemistry Regents Exam Part B-2. These are all short answer type questions. Let's just get started. So for 51 here, it says to state both the number of protons and the number of neutrons in a sulfur 33 atom. Now, anytime you see anything italicized, you really want to make sure that you're paying attention and answering the questions correctly. These questions aren't any easier or harder than the multiple choice, but a lot of times what happens is if you don't read things thoroughly, you're going to make a mistake. Okay, so in order to figure out how many protons and neutrons, we're going to have to get, of course, the atomic number off of the periodic table. The S-33, 33, of course, is going to tell us what isotope, meaning the total number of protons plus neutrons. But we need to figure out protons from the atomic number and then neutrons, we're going to subtract the atomic number from 33. So let's go grab that. All right, we need sulfur. Sulfur, you see here, is element 16. That means 16 protons and then 33 minus 16 for the number of neutrons. Now in writing down the answer, 16 protons and 33 minus 16, which is 17 neutrons. All right, we're off to 52. It says to show a numerical setup for calculating the atomic mass of sulfur. An atomic mass is a weighted average of the naturally occurring isotopes, and that's what you see in the table here. Let me tell you something. An atomic mass question comes up on every Regents exam. You don't want to get this wrong. In this case, you're doing a setup. Sometimes they'll just ask you for the answer. Now, what I say, and this comes from Mr. Sim that I work with, is you want to get mad. We're going to multiply, and that means the atomic mass times the natural abundance for every isotope, and then we're going to add them up and then divide by 100 in order to get credit. So let me show you that. This is an acceptable setup for the average atomic mass. Remember I said to get mad. You're going to multiply the mass by the natural abundance, which is percent. Remember, percent is parts per hundred. And then you're going to go ahead and multiply all these. They add them up, and then you divide the whole thing by 100. So this is one way to do it. Your teacher might have told you or showed you a different way. Doesn't matter. A question like this comes up every time on the Regents. You have to know it. For question 53, compare the energy of an electron in this third shell of a sulfur atom to the energy of an electron in the first shell of the same atom. The further away electrons are from the nucleus, the more energy that they have. So you could say the third shell electron has a greater energy than the first shell, or you could even say first shell has less energy than the third shell, but you have to compare both. So make sure you talk about the electron in the third shell and the electron in the first shell. With that, that's the first three questions here. Do me a favor, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do so. Hit the notification button. Let's keep going. Questions 54 through 57. We're looking at the setup. You have a reading passage here that describes a mixture. And we have two components, rock salt, NaCl, and then some small insoluble rock particles as well. Then it's going to be put into water, and then it's filtered right through filter paper, and the water is evaporated. You got information here about the lab data below. Question 54, we need to state evidence other than mass from the information given. So just by saying with filtration, we're separating components of a mixture, there's evidence. The other thing, of course, is that your sodium chloride dissolves in water while there are these other rock particles that don't dissolve in water. There are two examples then of evidence that we have different properties in rock salt. For 55, it says explain in terms of particle size why rock particles are trapped by the filter paper. Well, rock particles are too big to go through the filter paper, yet anything dissolved in water will pass through. For 56, state the number of sig figs in the mass of the beaker with the dry NaCl. 
we're looking at this value. What I tell my students, anytime you have a number greater than one and a decimal point, you count them all. That means the two, the four, the zero, and then the other zero to the right. That counts up to four significant figures. All of these values, as soon as you have a number greater than one and a decimal point, count them all. If you have a number less than one, you're not going to start counting until you've gone past those leading zeros, right? The zeros in the front. All right, and then finally for 57, a numerical setup. Once again, you're not calculating an answer here. You're just showing the work, plugging into an equation for percent by mass of sodium chloride in the rock salt sample. Let's go to the reference table. Reference table T has our percent composition, which works obviously for percent by mass. Here it is, the part over the whole thing times 100. Don't forget about this. It's not just the fraction, it's times 100. Remember, you're only showing a setup. We need the part that's going to be the NaCl, and then the whole thing is the rock salt sample. Well, we're gonna have percent by mass, so percent by mass, right, because this is just the setup now, is equal to, well, what is my mass of my sodium chloride? Taking a look at the data, it's not listed here you have to realize that you have a beaker with your sodium chloride only, and you have the mass of the empty beaker. So you are going to go ahead and subtract the mass of the beaker from the mass of the beaker and the sodium chloride. 240 minus 224.2, and it is 15.8 grams. And the rock salt sample originally was 16.4. Now, if you just left it as a fraction, you would not get credit. Remember, it's times 100. So here's a good setup. You could have also shown the 240 minus the 224.2 here in your numerator instead of 15.8, um, and you would get credit. But you're not going to get credit without that times 100. Okay, for this next group of questions, we have two gases, we have hydrogen and nitrogen, and each cylinder has the same volume. We're talking 500 milliliters for both. We're talking the same pressure, 101.3 kilopascals, and the same temperature. And we're asked in 58, compare the mass of the gas in cylinder A to the mass of the gas in cylinder B. Because all the conditions for the gas are the same, so the number of particles will be equal, but their masses are not the same. So nitrogen gas is heavier than hydrogen, or you could have said it hydrogen gas is lighter than nitrogen for 58. Then in 59, it says stated change in temperature and a change in pressure that will cause the gas in cylinder A to behave more like an ideal gas. This goes for any gas. If I raise the temperature and I lower the pressure, then any gas will behave more like an ideal gas for 59. For question 60, it says explain in terms of collisions between gas molecules in the walls of the container. Whenever you see explain in terms of, make sure you have that in your answer. It says why pushing the movable piston farther into cylinder B at constant temp would increase the pressure. Increasing the pressure is going to decrease the volume of the gas. If we're decreasing the volume of the gas, we're increasing the number of collisions between the gas molecules and the walls of the container for 60. For 61, here we are again with a numerical setup. We're going to calculate the volume of the gas in cylinder B at STP. Numerical setup means I'm plugging everything in, but I'm not going to calculate the answer. I'm going to go ahead to the reference tables and show you the equation, and we'll come on back and plug in. I'm dealing with gases, pressure, volume, temperature. When I go down my list, here it is, the combined gas law. Our initial conditions, which all have the number one, and then the final conditions, which all have the number two. So our initial conditions here for cylinder B was our pressure was the 101.3 
kilopascals. Now you don't have to put the units down, it's not required, you weren't asked to do that. Our initial volume was 500 milliliters, all right, and our initial temperature was 298 Kelvin. Now on the other side, I am going to go ahead and put in the conditions for STP. STP, standard temperature and pressure, are listed on the front of the reference tables. Make sure you go take a look so that you don't make a mistake. Well, it turns out the 101.3 is standard pressure that didn't change I'm looking for v2 and now my standard temp is 273 Kelvin done I don't have to do anything else just to set up and then keep going could you have crossed out the 101.3 yeah but you don't have to it's just the setup for 62 and 63 we have a paragraph here talking about the concentration of hydrochloric acid and then the concentration of uh, glucose. And in 62, once again, it says state in terms of concentration of ions. Why six molar HCl is a better conductor than 0.1 molar? Well, when you have a greater concentration, you have more ions in solution and therefore will be a better conductor. I want to show you the answer key. And by the way, when you're doing any studying for any test, you should have the answer key at your disposal. I'm trying to give you explanations. You can go ahead, do any regions questions, and then for ones that you didn't get right and you don't understand, then watch the video and fast forward to the ones that you need an explanation. I highly recommend that you do any work in chemistry where you have the answers somewhere so that you can correct your mistakes. The last thing you want to do is be practicing things wrong. Now for question 62, and the reason why I wanted to definitely show you this, is notice what it says. As a teacher scoring tests, I was not allowed to give credit for just saying more ions, all right? Because it is not in terms of concentrations of ions. Sounds picky? I agree, it sounds picky to me. But because it said explain in terms of concentration of ions, you better have the words concentration of ions in your answer. Seems ridiculous, I get it, but make sure that you do it and that's why you have to practice. Even if you pretty much think you know most of the material, you gotta practice the questions, especially the free response where the answer is not there. All right, let's go back. For 63, identify the element that allows it to be classified as an organic compound. Nobody should get this wrong. Organic compounds mean you have carbon containing compounds. There's your answer. Alrighty, here are the last two questions in part B 2. We have phosphorus 30 and phosphorus 32 and their radioisotopes. And phosphorus 30, we're told, decays by positron emission. For 64, complete the equation in your answer booklet. For the decay of phosphorus 30 by writing a notation for the missing product. Here is the nuclear reaction from the answer booklet. We have phosphorus 30 undergoing positron decay and we're going to go ahead and put our answer in this blank. Well remember when you balance nuclear equations you have your mass numbers on either side that have to add up to the same and your atomic numbers on either side that have to add up to the same. In other words, you can think of the arrow as an equal sign. So for the top here, I have 30 is equal to zero plus what number? Well, obviously it has to be 30. So we're talking about a mass number of 30. And then for the bottom, I have 15 is equal to one plus what number? Well, it has to be 14. 14 plus 1 is 15 so 30 as the mass number and 14 as the atomic number and then make sure you go to the periodic table to find element 14 which is silicon si for 65 we're going to table n it says determine the time required for the original 100 milligram sample of phosphorus 32 to decay until only 25 milligrams remains unchanged we need the half-life Table N, I'm going to go down to phosphorus 32. It's 14.28 days. 
I need that information to finish out part B-2. Okay, we're starting with 100 milligrams and we're going to 25. What happens is phosphorus 32 is undergoing decay. It's changing into something else. The time it takes for half of the mass to have changed into something else is 14.28 days. In other words, going from 100 grams of phosphorus 32 down to 50. That's one half-life. And then from 50, another half-life would mean I'd have 25 milligrams left. Now I just multiply my 14.28 by 2 to get the total time elapsed. Use your calculator. And when you do that, you're going to get an answer of 28.56 days. I hope I helped. This is part B-2 of the January 2020 Regents exam. Check out other videos on my channel, NY Chem Coach. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, good luck.